I think discomfort is just a granted, it's a given, right? When when we're going through change. Sometimes the harder thing actually is to leave the toxic situation, right? Or, or leave the situation that is not allowing you to flourish and for you to really live your purpose. Growing up, I was very ambitious. I wanted to change the world. I had a lot of lofty goals. Uh, and so I had a very narrow conception in a sense of, of what would be meaningful work. And I found that by expanding my definition of meaningful work, by changing my mindset, I could give meaning to what it was that I was doing. Um, as I mentioned, you know, even the concept of a career these days is uh, not static right? You know, growing up in my time, in my time, uh, it was very common for someone to have been with the same company or in the same industry for 20 or more years. Uh, and that's shifted with, with the generations, right? So Generation Z now, according to surveys, they're likely to change industries at least three times uh, in their working life. And about there was one survey that specifically said 73% of Generation Zers are actually um, more likely to take a pay cut or take a step down to do something that is more fulfilling to them, which I think is really interesting. Uh, you know, I love when, when you're thinking about a topic, all of a sudden, a lot of external things start showing up around you in your life that are related to the topic, right? And I saw a video uh, just two days ago about this woman. Uh, her name was Betty Reed Soskin, and she's 102 years old. She shared this story of how she'd been many different women throughout her life. She was a daughter. She was a mother. She was a businesswoman. Uh, she was a federal worker. At the age of 85 years old, she became a park ranger and she retired at 100. So, I mean, not only was this mind blowing and inspiring, but it also really resonated. Um, one of the things that she said was that what's important is the questions. Each time you ask a question, you may get a different answer because the person that you are, you've, you've grown since the last time you asked that question, right? Um, and so that's something that really resonates with me because I know that I have been different versions of myself. When I look at myself today in my career and, and what I think of as meaningful, it's very different than who I was three years ago, five years ago, and 10 years ago, and what I considered meaningful then as well. Uh, so as I mentioned, you know, when I when I was younger, um, I, I was actually very career oriented at a very early age. Uh, and I, I have to say, so Martina mentioned EBBF is a Baha'i inspired organization. Um, I was raised with the Baha'i teachings. I'm a Baha'i myself. And that was really transformative for me as, as a child growing up, gave me a lens with which to view the world and my place in it. Um, I'm, I'm still figuring out my place in it. But it was very helpful to have that framework growing up. And it, it also gave me motivation to make change, to make a difference, to have an impact. And there's one quote that I would like to share, and I'm actually going to screen share for this one because it's a little bit of a longer quote. And this for me, you know, when I think about career and, and work, uh, it just feels so all-encompassing and it's so beautifully said. So this is from a book, The Secret of Divine Civilization by Abdu'l-Baha, who is the son of the founding prophet of the Baha'i faith, Baha'u'llah. So it says, and the honor and distinction of the individual consist in this, that he among all the world's multitudes should become a source of social good. Is any larger bounty conceivable than this? that an individual looking within himself should find that by the confirming grace of God, he has become the cause of peace and well-being, of happiness and advantage to his fellow men. 
God has given us eyes that we may look about us at the world and lay hold of whatsoever will further civilization and the arts of living. He has given us ears that we may hear and profit by the wisdom of scholars and philosophers and arise to promote and practice it. Senses and faculties have been bestowed upon us to be devoted to the service of the general good, so that we distinguished above all other forms of life for perceptiveness and reason should labor at all times and along all lines, whether the occasion be great or small, ordinary or extraordinary, until all mankind are safely gathered into the impregnable stronghold of knowledge. We should continually be establishing new bases for human happiness and creating and promoting new instrumentalities toward this end. That's actually one of my favorite quotes ever <laughs> because it's something that I, I feel like I've constantly gone back to and referenced and you know, reading it at different points in your life, you may get new gleanings from it for sure. Uh, I do wish that when I was, you know, 10 or so years old thinking about my career, because I really was, uh, that I had an understanding of, of that quote, and I'll come back to specifically why. Um, but, you know, I, I, I was really thinking about how I can make the world a better place right? How, how can I be of service to humanity? And this was really driven for me by the Baha'i principles. So I was thinking uh, I wanted to work for the United Nations. Uh, I went to law school thinking that this would help open doors to working in diplomacy, uh, you know, working in, in human rights. And it was while I was in law school that I came across the notion of corporate social responsibility. Uh, and that's actually how I got connected with EBBF uh, in the first place. So I began thinking about the private sector and the role that the private sector could play in changing the world by leveraging its resources to, to make a difference. And so I had a, a bit of a shift in direction there. And, you know, it's funny, I remember this one time I was speaking to another law student D different school, um, but we'd we'd crossed paths, uh, shared shared values, shared you know desire to serve humanity, and she was studying. She was planning to go into international human rights law or something of the sort. And I was saying I was thinking about corporate law, and I remember that she scoffed at it. Um, it, it, it was a bit of a huh. You know, and and at that time, I really took it to heart. Clearly, it it has stuck with me <laughs> since then, um, because I remember thinking, well, why 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 couldn't I make a difference? You know, by by going into the private sector, by focusing on um, on corporate law, and I ended up still taking an in house role at a at a global startup. I was able to help get the Corporate Social Responsibility Committee started um, in our New York office. And yet with time, I still began questioning the meaning of what I was doing. You know, I had this moment, um, the, the, the company that I worked for provided products and services to investment firms. So after a while, I'm sitting there thinking, like, why, why am I here? What am I doing? What, you know, is, is my company benefiting society? How is it? Are we just helping people with money make more money? Right. And I know that I'm not the only person who's had these questions and struggled with it. I remember at the time speaking with other people who had similar questions. Right. And so that was what triggered the first mindset shift for me. And it was around impact. And I, I had to ask myself all these questions. Okay, so what am I doing? How am I helping the world? Does, do, does my impact have to be on this massive scale? Do I need to be the secretary general of, of the United Nations uh, to, to make a difference? Um, is it enough that I, I'm making an income and I can you know, leverage my resources to to have the time and flexibility to make a difference in in different ways. Um, am I gaining perhaps in in personal and professional growth through this work experience that is preparing me for a different role later on? Uh, 
How about the impact I have through my interactions with others and the experience that they are able to have through their work with me? So thinking about how I was being a leader in the organization, how I was mentoring and coaching others on my team, et cetera, and how I can impact at a, at a smaller scale. So really thinking, and, and that goes back to the quote that I shared, um, whether the occasion be great or small, ordinary or extraordinary, that really stuck out to me because it reminds me of, of what I went through at that moment, which was thinking about how I, I would feel fulfilled if I just had an impact on, on one single person in my life, right? Um, but I think what was most, m- more of a shift for me at that point in terms of my mindset again, was this idea of working, um, being worship when done in the spirit of service. And, and this is a concept in the Baha'i faith. Uh, and that for me was very transformative in, in that moment, right? So there's uh, another quote that I'll I'll quickly share. This is from the most holy book written by Baha'u'llah. It's the book of laws of the Baha'i faith. It is incumbent upon each one of you to engage in some occupation, such as a craft, a trade, or the like. We have exalted your engagement in such work to the rank of worship of the one true God. So just going to work, working, with the spirit of service is inherently a, a spiritual act, right? So, so when I think about what is meaningful work, there is actually this inherent spiritual nature to the work. It, it doesn't have to be that I'm working for, you know, a, a nonprofit organization um, that's driving change at the the grassroots and and scaling and so on. Uh, so th- so that was for me the first mindset set shift and and I wanted to just kind of pause there for a moment to to welcome questions there you know it's again been a journey there there have been a couple other mindset shifts that I've had that I'm happy to share but I'd I'd love to hear from from anyone if you have questions at this point yeah I, I was just reflecting out of the many things you were saying again about the importance of pausing as we are doing right now right how many times we run during our day-to-day our career and we never take really the time to stop and re- reflect on those important questions right that sometimes uh, can make us uh, shift the perspective so y- you have been sharing some valuable question that can be uh, of inspiration uh, for others I, I wonder how important it has been during those moments of pause and reflection and self-doubting and question, having the right environment around yourself for consultation? That's that's such a great question. It's been very important. So I, I think it's there are two two aspects. One is that internal reflection and and kind of gaining clarity. And I've spent a lot of time doing that. And it's certainly not a one and done. You know, I I really think that it's important to make time at various intervals to just take a moment and and reflect and reevaluate. And, you know, how do how do you do that? I I like to journal. So I'm I'm often journaling around one thing I'm thinking of. And, you know, I might repeat it again the next week, kind of same thing. Um, I find that helpful as a way of, of gaining some more clarity. And I think another part of gaining clarity is through speaking and consulting with others. So absolutely, I think um, if if you are, you know, sometimes it's a, it's a blessing, right, to, to have a support network. And so if someone doesn't have a network of, of people that they can, you know, trust and, and consult with, uh, I definitely recommend spending some time trying to build that network of and and community and so ebbf for example is is such a beautiful space uh, where people are actively creating spaces to have this dialogue but then also just connecting with each other right so you're you're able to meet new people who are maybe in a totally different place in their life there's also a lot of value 
to hearing perspective from someone who has a very different experience than you, right? So we don't want to live in an echo chamber. Um, so I, I definitely do think that consultation for me has been very important. I've been very lucky to have not just my parents that I can consult with and, and really benefit from their experience, but other other friends, other colleagues who I trust and, and value their opinion. But you know, there's, there's also, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to call it consultation with God. So I, I do think prayer and meditation is also very helpful. So, you know, whether you have a relationship with the creator or not, um, if you prefer to think about the universe as, you know, always providing for us, I think it's also very helpful to quiet ourselves and, and connect with, with our inner self. Uh, and to ask the questions. Um, I I do think sometimes there are more questions than answers. And uh, maybe I'm going to segue into Danielle's question. (laughs) The first question about how can we be comfortable in mindset shift mode? I don't know that you can be. It's hard. Maybe maybe other people uh, have, have other experiences with this, but I, th- I think, you know, one thing that I've been hearing a lot in the last couple of years is this idea of being comfortable with being uncomfortable. I think discomfort is just a granted, it's a given, right? When, when we're going through change, I remember several years back, um, this actually takes me to my mindset shift number two, which was when I left my job. So I actually ended up deciding to leave that in-house counsel role after five years. Hard and easy decision. And the Before mindset... Before you proceed, do you mind sharing why uh, you have decided to take this decision? What was that specific question probably you asked yourself? That to, made to, you leave, to leave the yeah. job, yeah. So this is precisely the mindset shift, which was um, a misalignment of rewards. So there there were actually a lot of reasons, but that's the one that I want to hone in on. And uh, I I think, you know, often oftentimes we 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 don't often speak about meaningful work and rewards in a, a way that is is kind of natural and. I kind of want to normalize that, right? Like I think oftentimes we think of of meaningful work as something that is, you know, of direct service to to humanity and service and getting paid don't always <laughs> seem to go hand in hand, right? Um, that's a that's a very kind of basic way of of looking at it. And of course, not always true. It's a generalization. But in in terms of, you know, how I was thinking about my work, I realized at that point in time that it was important for me to be rewarded for what I was doing. And that's especially difficult as a woman. You know, we we have a general understanding that when it comes to negotiations in employment, right, women are less likely to to ask for higher salary and, and to negotiate than men. Um, so I've always been kind of conscious of these things and and you know, try to ask for what you think you deserve. I think that's really important for people to do. And I think that there can be meaning in your career when it's something that gives you the means to live a good life and to enjoy your life and to be of service and to continue being of service, right? Uh, there's a a wonderful quote another another quote that I'm going to share uh, from Baha'u'llah, again, the the founding prophet of the Baha'i faith. The best of men are they that earn a livelihood by their calling and spend upon themselves and upon their kindred for the love of God. So I, I think that's a really beautiful one and a good reminder to me that you know, when when you're working and, and you're thinking about building a meaningful career, one component that you can think about is also reward, right? So there's impact, there's reward. And when I left that job, it I actually, 
again, as I mentioned, it was for many reasons, um, but I left without having another job lined up. Uh, and so, you know, the older generations would would probably kind of freak out about that, right? Like you want to have some security, right? Um, for me, it was a really important time of taking a step back, um, doing that internal work, thinking about what I wanted to do next and making sure that each step I was taking was meaningful, was intentional. I, I was making a deliberate choice. And and using all of my learnings so far to make that choice. But it was a really challenging, Daniel, going back to your question, it was a really challenging period for me. Um, a, a lot of uncertainty, uh, but it's one that really allowed me to have a deeper understanding of some spiritual principles, such as the role of tests in our lives. Uh, and and that really, these tests are how we are able to strengthen, develop uh, spiritual attributes, resilience, um, patience, trust, surrender. Oh my goodness! You know, detachment. These these are principles that I'd grown up, you know, hearing about, reading about. I had a, a general understanding and a belief in the importance of these principles, but it really wasn't until then that I truly understood. And it was through the pain, right? Like you're you're in the pain of these tests and it's like, oh, okay. Now let me find some gratitude. Uh, and, and so I think, again, uh, to your question, Daniel, there are ways that you can become a bit more comfortable in the shifts. And, and I think it's through letting go. <laughs> Or, or just going through, you know, I, I think when people talk about physical pain, right, it's just like, okay, breathe through it, right? And I think when it comes to these challenging periods, it's it's similar. It's the mindset. Um, if we can find things that we can be grateful for, I think that's really helpful. And, and same way when we're, you know, when we're having a hard time seeing meaning in something, because it's not obvious, it's not right in front of our faces. If we can start thinking about gratitude, okay, what am I grateful for? Then maybe that's where the meaning is, right? And, and you mentioned gratitude because I'm thinking, okay, now you step in the next job or the next phase, the third, the fourth phase, and you have an expectation. And from my experience, the reality and the expectation always differ. So how do you use your mindset to say, oh, this is not what I expected, because I think the mind is so powerful and our mindset, our attitude, our reaction to things is so important. How did you react to, oops, is not quite as expected, maybe better, maybe worse, this differentiation between expectation and reality, what is your mindset? How do you manage that? And at which point after, after I left, and what or in the new when you enter the new job you're entering a new job you're expecting something maybe it works maybe it doesn't and then you and you adapt you ask questions you don't accept you accept what is your thinking pattern into maintaining this meaningful dream that you had built which, in your journaling so what has been helpful for me has been an understanding that we co-create our reality so, you know, I, I go to this new place and try to make the best of it, right? Uh, as, as an entrepreneur or whether I'm working with someone else's company and helping them build it up, things don't always work out, like you said. And it could be for any number of, of reasons. Um, it, you may think that it has all the right ingredients, right? You've You've kind of you know, reviewed your criteria, you've had this process of reflection and reevaluation and okay, great, I'm looking for X, Y, Z, and then you show up, like you said, and it's a little bit different. Something else is out of place. And so I think that's why it's important to have this constant process of reflection and, and reevaluation. And uh, it's it's not to be fickle, Right. Like, I, I don't think people need to give up that easily. Um, but there are times where it just doesn't make sense. And there's a quote from Stephen Bartlett. Uh, he's an entrepreneur and investor. And 
uh, he, it's along the lines of, you know, quitting is for winners. And I really love that uh, because, you know, we're, we grow up learning, don't quit, right? Quitting is for losers. And uh, I, I certainly don't think that people should quit and give up willy nilly, but sometimes the harder thing actually is to leave the toxic situation, right? Or, or leave the situation that is not allowing you to flourish and for you to really live your purpose. So I think, uh, again, through through reflection, listening to your intuition, that for me has been a learning journey. How do I quiet my ego? How do I listen to my intuition? Um, you know, I, I really try not to make decisions out of fear. So I don't make quick decisions. I, I you know, uh, I don't want to get emotional and, you know, it's, I had a really hard day and I've, I've certainly done that in the past where you have a really hard day and then you go onto LinkedIn and you're searching for new jobs, right? I know people who have, who have done that. Um, but I, I do think it's important to, to take that time and to really center yourself. Um, so that's something that I've, I've tried to do is ask myself questions. So why, like, that's one of my favorite questions is why, and then the why behind the why behind the why and keep kind of going back, peeling back the layers and, you know, my self-awareness throughout the years has thankfully increased <laughs> a bit. So I I know myself and I, I know that there will be moments where I have certain fears. And so I stop and I say, okay, well, am I am I making this decision because I'm I'm scared and it's the easier decision to make, or am I making this decision for a more elevated reason that that is emanating from my soul rather than my ego right um, does that does that answer your question yeah I don't know it resonates a lot with me I don't know with the rest of the audience and I can see that uh, uh, both from a personal and and professional level right uh, I, I do agree if I look back at my own personal story taking that step and deciding to leave that toxic situation uh it has been uh, way harder than staying uh, in that uncomfort, uh, comfortable situation, right? Um, so I, what I would like to ask you today is like uh, something that uh, was triggered by the previous conversation we had. I think for most most of the people, um, it is very easy to seek meaning uh, in the career, right? Uh, particularly at a younger age, as you were describing before, you enter a new organization or a new institution, you are so ambitious, you want to change the world. Uh, and you hope to find that meaning, that purpose in the job, in the work. And But you have also mentioned the possibility of uh, uh, make that job meaningful for yourself. Uh, I think that has been a shift of your mind, right? From seeking the meaning to create the meaning yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What has been the process there? <laughs> Who has accompanied you in this journey? Have you been really able to co-create uh, uh, this space that you wanted to find uh, together uh, with your colleagues or the organization? Mm. Where you... Yeah, great question. So, okay, let me give us some thought. I, I, I do think that some work experiences can bring you closer to understanding your purpose. And actually the Baha'i writings speak to this too, um, which I think is fascinating. And more recently for me, uh, it, it has been around thinking through my purpose and how do I give meaning to my career by fulfilling my purpose? through the work that I'm doing. And this was, I would say it was during the pandemic. Again, you know, sometimes it's the turbulent times that give you pause for, for reflection. And I, I was in a transition period and I kind of went back to basics. So who am I? What do I enjoy doing? There was, uh, I'm going to share this really quickly as well, actually. 
So in, in terms of thinking about my purpose, there's this really cool uh, concept in, in Japanese ikigai, which is basically your reason for being. And there's a beautiful diagram that I came across that I would love to share very quickly with you all. So it's the convergence of what you love, what the world needs, what you are good at, and what you can be paid for. So this is uh, the sources management 3.0 of this particular diagram, which I really liked. Um, I'm I'm going to stop sharing just so I can see all your beautiful faces. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, you know, I I started. So you asked about. Um, you know, people that I spoke to or, or different kind of resources and support. And I'm not the biggest fan of social media, but I do think that there's a lot of valuable content out there if you can find it, right? Uh, so it, it depends on who, you, who you're choosing to follow and, and what type of information you're looking to gather. But, you know, I, I get a lot of content around entrepreneurship, uh, you know, different types of life coaches, et cetera. And uh, I, I came across this one program and it, I decided to check it out and, and they presented this idea of Ikigai. And it was very useful to me at the time because I was thinking through my purpose. And this is actually, I went back again because I journal, I can go back to things. And it was just a year ago yesterday that I was writing down what my purpose was. So three things actually, create, lead, and empower. So it, it was through a combination of things that, um, you know, I was able to sort of hone this idea for myself of, of what is my purpose? You know, as a Baha'i, I have an understanding of the general purpose of life, which is to develop spiritually to, to transform myself and then simultaneously to transform society, to, to contribute to the betterment of, of the world. But then I think, okay, me, Desiree, one person, unique, what, why am I here? What is, what is my purpose? Why am I different than anybody else? Right. And so I was able to kind of narrow down, narrow down my purpose to three things. And for me, it was really interesting because I, I could see how that felt right for me in terms of who I am, what I enjoy doing, what I, what I'm good at and what I could get paid for. Right. Ikigai. And yet that's, that's, that's a lot, you know, am I going to be fulfilling that purpose all at the same time, you know, these three things, am I going to find a job that allows me to fulfill that purpose, each of those three things, or, or will it be at different times in my life, you know? Uh, so maybe in one phase of my life, and I have so many different interests, right? So maybe at one point in my life, I'm able to spend more time creating, maybe in another point in my life, I'm, I'm leading, I'm empowering others in, in a different way. Uh, and so there's a lot of flexibility, but it was helpful that I was able to create some criteria for myself to evaluate the next line of work that I was going to enter into. And it was definitely, again, through a combination of, you know, reflection, meditation, of consulting with other people. Uh, and so this this was the that third mindset shift for me which was you know i i take this work i i give it meaning i fulfill my purpose rather than you know trying to find myself in my work and and find meaning in my work i've i've found myself i understand myself and and now i want to do work that allows me to be the best version of me and and to reach my potential yeah, it, it does. Again, it does very, very much resonate uh, with me. And so we touch base on the Ikigai and importance of purpose during our last session uh, uh, as well. The, the only thing that um, I think is important 
to keep in mind is that uh, that purpose may change throughout our mm -hmm. career, right? Having it clear is super important, but allowing ourselves the possibility to accept that change of that purpose is super important because uh, not meeting expectations sometimes can can cause uh, frustration and the motivation. So when before you were saying different answer to the same question, mm -hmm. story, okay. and also to the question, what is my purpose, right? The, that answer can uh, change mm -hmm. so many times throughout our career. Is mm -hmm. there any specific question that you have asked yourself and you are, um, you are aware that that answer has changed throughout your career? It, it can be... I would love to ask you if your definition of meaning, right, has changed or your definition of success has changed in the past uh, decade or more. Yes, I'll I'll briefly answer that. And then I saw Rachel has a question as well that I'd love to get to. Um, so in, in terms of yeah, what has so much so much has changed. I mean, I've I've changed so much and I'm so aware of that that I know that the way I view things has definitely changed. Um, I'll I'll speak to your question about success uh, in terms of how I view. You know, I think for a while I kind of had this basic idea of success, which is you set goals, you achieve them, you're successful, right? I did I did very well as as a young student. You know, I getting awards. I was an athlete and so on. Um, I am constantly, you know, creating goals for myself, uh, vision boards, uh, I have, um, you know, career ambitions and so on. And yet I can also look at the things that I've quote unquote achieved and not feel successful. Right. So for me, it really doesn't mean that much when I think about setting these goals, you know, you, you set one milestone, you achieve one milestone, then you're on to the next, Right. So for me, success is really in the striving. And, and I think that's, that's the point is that we're constantly moving forward. When you stop, that's when you fail. And for me, you know, I, I mentioned uh, wanting to, to find work that allows me to fulfill my purpose and reach my potential. For me, my biggest fear in life is to not reach my potential. I think success is reaching your potential but what makes it tricky is that we don't know what our potential is <laughs> right and so again i think we're just meant to constantly be testing our limits and and pushing forward um so my i, I don't know that i have a, a definition of success other than that it's striving um but it's it's definitely evolved in in time yeah Desiree, you were starting to to really get at my question already in what you were just sharing. But I guess as someone who is currently working two jobs, one that provides financial stability and one that kind of leans into my creative aspects, I find often a challenge with time um, and the time that's left over to feel like I'm being of service in the world. And so I wonder if particularly as a new Baha'i who is always kind of overwhelmed by the amount of incredible work that Baha'is are doing around me in the field of service um, to humanity. I wonder if you've ever struggled with kind of feeling like what you're doing is not enough um, and whether or not you've had mindset shifts in terms of like how to view what you're doing as contributionary and enough um, or how you've kind of balanced that. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. That's a great question. And I think that ties in very naturally to the some of the earlier uh, thoughts I shared around impact. Um, so yeah, your your question is one that I know a lot of people <laughs> definitely grapple with. And I for me, it um it feels like a, a dichotomy that we don't necessarily need to make, right? So again, if if we're are approaching our work, whether it's the, the job that you have to create financial stability or the other work that you're doing with this spirit of service that you're doing good work that is benefiting humanity in some way, shape or form, um, 
I think there's a lot of, of value in that. So I think that should, first of all, be, you know, acknowledged and, and appreciated and valued. And in terms of, you know, additional time, for me personally, I uh, just, just, again, this is very personal to me, um, and other people may have had different experiences and, and answers to this. I've gone through kind of ebbs and flows in terms of my time and, and how busy I am and how much I can allocate to maybe community building activities or to some of the nonprofit work that I do um, that I might see more visibly as a service, right? And I I have to just come to terms with things and, and accept them and, and know that it can change and that you know, as we're talking about the the evolution of of meaning, um, our our time, our accessibility, the phase of life that we're in is also going to change. You know, there are people who have you know children that they're raising as well, and and everyone is constantly having to to juggle things. And so, I think part of it is just um, taking that moment to accept where you are in that moment. Uh, and I find it helpful in everything I'm doing to just ask God, to ask the universe, you know, how can I be of better service and kind of set that intention and, and see what doors open up, what opportunities arise, um, that we're able to take advantage of, whether that's, you know, in your professional life or elsewhere, uh, and and so I you know I wish I had a, a better answer to that, but I think it it really is about the mindset shift. Um, and again, that sort of co-creation that right now maybe you don't have as much time as you'd like to be dedicating to things, but taking time then to create a plan of action, right? So again, that clarity reflection. Uh, creating a plan of action. What what do I want to change? What do I value more? How do I make the the changes necessary to get to where I want to be? And it might not happen overnight, um, but I think with setting the right intentions and then taking action towards that, you'll see those opportunities opening up. Thank you, Desiree. Uh, and thank you, everyone. I, I want to thank you for your openness and uh, honesty and vulnerability in sharing your personal story as well. Those those are the session I like where we talk about real life experiences and, and challenges and moments of joy as well. Uh, and I think today you gave us really a lot of food for thoughts, uh, particularly for me, the importance of taking breaks and pause and really asking ourselves the right question when we feel that uncomfortable feeling coming from within, recognizing that and stop and, uh, and being able to ask those uncomfortable questions and uh, why not uh, being able to, to consult uh, with a support system, right? So the importance as well to create a support system uh, around ourselves uh, uh, to continue that journey, the striving to become our best version, our best uh, self, both personally and uh, and uh, and professionally.